we picked, you know, the fastest gut so we could, you know, study. And at 18 years old, as you say, eating, you know, two slices of another mushroom pizza at 800 calories, and it takes 14 hours for them to get that, not through their bowels, but just through the small intestine alone. But at this transit time, when we realized it was that slow, and these young people really, really kind of shifted our, our, our understanding of why the American diet is so prone to inducing things like diverticulosis, the phenomenon of inflammatory bowel disease and, and irritable bowel syndrome, and all these you know, you know, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. The U.S. leads in all of these diseases. And this study started to give us perspective of, man, there's a lot of stress that goes through if you're eating two or three meals a day that have this high protein content. Dr. Zach Bush, welcome to the Keto Camp Podcast. Thanks for having me on. Excited to be with your whole audience. I'm excited. I love your work. You're doing amazing things and we'll talk all about that. But if you could just go back in time and share your story about how you went from conventional medicine to what you're doing today. Very nonlinear path. Um, fortunately, we never can plan out our own lives to create really boring lives. Um, uh, my life you know, started in engineering, actually, and then uh, had an opportunity to go over to the Philippines and uh, there, I worked with a group of international midwives birthing babies in squats outside of um, Manila, Philippines. And that, I had never done anything medical in my life. It was just kind of you know, an opportunity to do some you know, outside the box work. That was so transformational that I came back, dropped out of the engineering program, and went into medicine uh, direction. Um, initially, began going to go into nursing because I really hated school. I couldn't imagine becoming a doctor. Um, but uh, you know, went, went to the nursing pathway, then thought, uh, well, maybe there's more flexibility with the nurse practitioner pathway, and then eventually got myself in the bedroom. I might as well just go to medical school and get this thing over with. And then, of course, I knew absolutely nothing about the journey. I didn't know it was going to be 17 years before I actually completed that journey. So spent 17 years in academia in different areas. I uh, went into internal medicine as an initial subspecialty, then I uh, was a chief resident at the University of Virginia, which is a teaching position on faculty, teaching med students and residents, uh, hospital-based allopathic medicine. Um, got very fascinated with endocrinology in medical school, and then during my internal medicine stuff, got more and more riveted by the possibility of understanding how the body coordinates 70 trillion cells to be, you know, a, a healthful organism, and uh, doing very, you know, tertiary you know, referral center medicine in the hospital, I was starting to see the, the symptoms of a collapsing healthcare system, uh, the symptoms of collapsing literal health on the planet as we were starting to see more and more chronic disease take up our hospitals rather than acute disease management. It's very pertinent actually right now where we hear that the coronavirus is overrunning hospitals, ICUs and, you know, resources. It's not doing anything outside the scope of, of any hospital in the world. What's, what's put these hospitals on the brink of, of lack of resources is how much chronic disease those hospitals are now having to manage. Hospitals should have never managed chronic disease. It's not a good model for chronic disease management. Hospitals coming out of the technology of, of military experience on battlefields, hospitals were built around battlefield medicine, around trauma and acute illness management, acute heart attack being perhaps, you know, the closest we can come into chronic disease realm, which is something that the, the current medical system does well. Now you take that and you bury it in complications of obesity, such as fatty liver and end-stage liver disease from fatty liver and diabetes and complications of vascular disease and amputation and chronic infections and all this. That's what swamped our healthcare system. That's not what the healthcare system should be doing it, that's disease management and that's what's got our hospitals all at the brink of lack of resources and everything else this current coronavirus event this pandemic that keeps getting all this you know pr of this is a huge tragedy it doesn't even register on the radar screen of problems compared to where our chronic disease epidemics are stressing the system um so that happens to be you know just a good you know modern moment example of what was happening to me in my maturation of my career realizing I needed to go down a pathway that was going to start to address the underpinnings of this chronic disease burden that was really crippling not just the hospital care, but I could see it crippling our entire economy and actually being the downfall of the U.S. You know, leadership and, and empire as it stood um, back in the in, you know, end of the last century. 
And sure enough, we see the erosion of the U.S. you know strength and empire, and increasingly we re require and demand military action to support our economy uh, because we're losing the underpinnings of our our financial stability due to the cost of healthcare the disease management today. So that whole thing was shifting my paradigm. I decided I wanted to go into endocrinology because it was a pathway to understanding how health happens and how dysfunction within that, that coordinating system of the hormones, uh, how disease emerges. And so I went into endocrinology and metabolism. Um, initially, my interest was in brain uh, plasticity and how the brain changes to, new, to hormonal inputs. And uh, that was kind of in the you know, 2003 to 2000, well, I guess it started in 1999 with my first research in that, but late 90s, early 2000s, nobody was talking about the gut and nobody was talking, about, we were talking about the brain. And so the brain was kind of my way into the, the ultimately 10 years later into the microbiome. By the late 2000s, the microbiome was starting to be talked about all the time. But by that time, my funding had dried up for the, the brain kind of mood disorder stuff and its relationship to the endocrine system and stress pathways. And the funding was now getting poured from the entire pharmaceutical industries and being redirected from cardiovascular disease into uh, cancer. And so uh, Pfizer and a bunch of pharmaceutical companies shut down their entire research divisions and, and research investment arms for cardiovascular disease between 2009 and 2011. You know, so that, that pipeline was drying up and they were rechanneling those funds into cancer research. So I got caught up in that opportunity to get some grant support for research. And my area of interest was developing new novel chemotherapy agents derived from, from nutrients. And so I was working with vitamin A compounds and seeing how they can kill cancer. And so I was studying apoptosis or programmed cell suicide and uh, methodologies for turning that on in, in damaged cells. So that was kind of the journey. And in that cancer research, you know, I, I started to realize that you know, after three or four years of working with vitamin A, that that stuff actually came from food. And that I should probably go back and teach myself nutrition because I had gotten zero, you know, adequate nutrition and education in my 17 years there. So backed up, uh, retaught myself what I thought was nutrition at the time. And uh, a couple of patients introduced me to a book from Neil Barnard's program for reversing diabetes and plant-based uh, nutrition to reverse chronic disease. The book is short read, quick. Flip the pages in two days completely changed my entire perspective on my entire career and, and everything. And so that little book from Neil Barnard um, was a catalyst for change of understanding my chemotherapy, my endocrine, uh, everything up to, to the very foundation of where I thought I was going. So redirected in 2010, uh, left academia, started a nutrition center just to teach plant-based medicine. Uh, to reverse chronic disease in the Forest County in Virginia. So I set up in this little town of 550 people and decided I was gonna you know, save, save rural Virginia. Not in order to save Virginia, but I'm always, I'm a kind of big thinker person, this go big or go home kind of mentality. And so I wanted to do that because I knew if I could figure out how to get this small, poor, rural town to start to take you know, control of its food sovereignty slash health sovereignty, I would have a model that would then scale to the whole world to really prevent the chronic disease collapse of, of humankind. And so that that big, big you know, dream vision started just very simply. It was just me alone in my little plumbing building that I renovated into something that marginally looked like a, a, a clinic. And we started work and in 2012, two years into that journey, um, I started studying soil uh, with a colleague because uh, we were convinced that uh, the plant-based medicine wasn't working anymore pounding these people with kale and cruciferous vegetables, anti-inflammatory diets, and their inflammation markers were going up, not down. So we were realizing that the food had become efficient compared to the science of the 1970s that we were basing all of our protocols on. And so we started studying soil. As soon as we did that, it blew open my world because we found some carbon molecules that looked like the chemotherapy I used to develop, but it was sitting there in soil. And when we found out it was being made by bacteria and fungi, it connected all of my dots in my in my academic world, which was why well, was Harvard and, and Stanford showing that the genomics of the bacteria in the gut were predicting cancer occurrence and cancer outcomes in humans. How is that possible? These correlations were being made genetically, but nobody can put those pieces together because our, our model of cancer didn't fit the microbiome. 
And even to this day, I would argue that all of the cancer centers in the world have continued to fail to consider the microbiome and gut physiology in cancer management. Uh, you know, unfortunately, there's functional medicine and alternative medicine and integrated medicine, and all these different you know, uh, fields of alternative practices, which you know are actually not an alternative any at all. They actually are based on 4,000 years of Chinese medicine and, and nutrition uh, knowledge from the 5,000 years of Ayurvedic practices in India and all this. So the deep, deep thousand year old wisdom that is in this you know, gut health area. And that's where you guys come in and keto camp in such an interesting space, which is you know this idea of fasting and all of that. So we moved from gut health to microbiome to microbiome and, and patterns of, of uh, mitochondrial medicine, uh, mitochondria being the other half of the endocrinology and metabolism specialty. And so I, all my research was in the mitochondria and how they turn on apoptosis. And fasting, of course, doesn't do apoptosis. It does something slightly different called autophagy in those long-term fasts. And autophagy is kind of the cleanup of the inside of the cell. And so you're, you're digesting you know, waste material and, and uh, pro, you know, misfolded proteins and all kinds of junk that's inside the cell as, uh, as nutrient sources uh, when those cells go into long-term fasting. So um, from autophagy to apoptosis, the mitochondria play a very vital role. They obviously are in direct relationship and communication with the microbiome of your gut, bacteria, fungi, and ultimately, you know, to the point of today, uh, with what's going on with the pandemic, the viruses. Thank you for sharing that. And I, I'd love to talk a little bit more about, about fasting since you, you left off there. And you, you reference a study where uh, they did in University of Virginia, I believe, where they took these participants and they were college students and they had 800 calories of a standard American diet, I believe it was pizza. And you tracked how long it took for their, from, that, from chewing to, diet, to processing that out the colon. And it, and it said 14 hours for that meal. So meaning if we're not at least fasting for 14 hours, if you're eating a standard American diet, what happens in the body? What, what kind of backlog happens in the body? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so that's Dr. Michael Corner that was one of the PIs on that research project. And uh, these young, healthy college students were fed uh, a pizza meal at Mellow Mushroom in Charlottesville, Virginia, which is like this kind of cult following pizza place. And, and it's, you know, so everybody in, in, in the city can relate to a, a Mellow Mushroom pizza. Like it's some of the best pizza you can eat. It's not like Domino's or, you know, it's not quote unquote crap. Pizza, it's, it's good food. You think, okay, these are the best ingredients we could get if you're going to eat a pizza. And so we gave it to these college kids. And you know, youth is is playing strong on the on the benefit to this study in that the gut metabolism and gut motility of an 18 year old is much different than the gut motility of a 35 or 40 year old. We slow down our gut motility dramatically over the course of our lifetime. And so that's why, you know, by the time we're in our 60s, 70s, 80s, constipation starts to become a real issue for many, many people because their gut motility is starting to freeze up. Um, and so we picked, you know, the fastest gut so we could, you know, study. And at 18 years old, as you say, that eating, you know, two slices of mellow mushroom pizza at 800 calories, and it takes 14 hours for them to get that, not through their bowels, but just through the small intestine alone. And so that, that is a very long journey. Now, small intestine is long. It's you know, certainly a lot longer than the colon. But it's transit time when we realized it was that slow. And these young people really really kind of shifted our, our, our understanding of why the American diet is so prone to inducing things like diverticulosis, which is the outpouching and destruction of the, the macro structure of the colon, uh, the phenomenon of inflammatory bowel disease and, and irritable bowel syndrome, and all these uh, you know, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, U.S. leads in all of these diseases. And this study started to give us a perspective of, man, there's a lot of stress that goes through if you're eating two or three meals a day that have this high protein content. And the high protein in this case is, is namely dairy and, and meat in a mix. And then you put next to that a carbohydrate source like GMO wheat that's in the crust of that pizza. And that's destroying the, the gut integrity uh, at, the, at the tight junction level. So you get a leaky gut on top of this very slow moving mass of protein. This is the setup for chronic disease and dysfunction of the intestinal lining. 
and then subsequently the liver gets inflammation, it's changing hormonal cascades, the liver really dictates the endocrine system in a huge way. So when you start getting stress in the liver, you, you develop fatty liver very quickly, inflammatory changes cascade through the whole system, the whole vascular system goes in flame, blood brain barrier starts to break down, kidney tube will stop filtering well, and you become kind of a, a sponge for toxin and, and inflammation. And so that's the phenomenon that we can see with a couple slices of the pizza. Fortunately, the study also contained a plant-based arm where they, they were given a plant-based meal with no processed grains, but whole grains. So it was whole grain-based uh, uh, source of starch, carbohydrate, and protein combined with a bunch of veggies. And so it was a calorie mash, 800 calories. Um, the first thing that the, the individuals reported was shock over how big of a plate of food that had to be to match the two slices of the pizza they'd been given the night before. And so, you know, they, it was the same group cohort that went through both arms. And uh, in that same group of people, it only took 90 minutes for that plant-based diet uh, to go through the small test. So you've got 90 minutes versus 14 hours. And now you imagine the stacking of those meals. And so one of the challenges that the ketogenic movement had at its beginning was there was this concept of protein was going to heal everything. And, you know, eventually it got to the realization, well, no, protein has nothing to do with ketosis. It, Protein is all converted to carbohydrate by the liver. And so you're really eating sugar when you eat anything more than maybe eight or 10 grams of protein, you're really consuming sugar at, at the cellular level. And so we realized too much protein can actually disrupt uh, ketosis severely. And so then we got into the ideas of, you know, fat being more important than protein and fasting being more important than, than fat when it came to really inducing the, the physiologic changes we were hoping to achieve with ketosis. Um, so that's, you know, that study, I think, is indicative of why the American diet is so inflammatory and, you know, the opportunity that we have when we go to a whole food, plant-based diet doesn't mean you're vegan. It just means that you're eating a ton of real, unprocessed, you know, whole grains, starches, and carbohydrates. That mix is magical for the small intestine. Gut motility is a direct measure of neurologic function. So when you see a ramped up 90 minute transit time for the small intestine, you know that the whole neurologic system is happy at that moment. You've got nerves that are firing, muscle groups, small smooth muscle uh, controlling the small intestine. All that smooth muscle coordination is happening without uh, any you know, vagal stress. The, the vagus nerve obviously running all of the you know, functions from the back of your throat all the way through your lungs and respiratory drive, your heart, your, your cardio, cardiovascular drive, heart rate, things like that. Your, the, tension of your blood vessels, your peripheral blood pressure, uh, being uh, getting feedback from that vagus nerve all the way down, of course, into gut motility, uh, innervation of the stomach, pancreas, liver, gallbladder, all the way down into uh, the descending colon, or I'm sorry, the ascending colon, transverse colon. All of that is innervated by a single nerve. And so when we see the vagus nerve really pop in action and really do, you know, unperturbed rest and digest activity, we can be very confident that the neurologic system is happy. And in contrast, you see that they shut down and falter and it takes 14 hours to move the same number of calories through the gut. You know that there's a lot of neurologic confusion going on at that moment. You've sent the neurologic system somehow into a fight or flight state that freezes the gut motility. And so you're, you're, your fight or flight state being your sympathetic nervous system, when it gets activated, gut motility stops. And so you don't want to be digesting food while you're trying to channel energy to the muscle to run away from you know, whatever is threatening your life. So that fight or flight state is somehow getting turned on by this protein overdose, by this inflammatory you know, event of processed grain and uh, processed carbs slash you know, heavy protein load uh, passing the gut uh, slowly. Yeah, and you and you add to that what's happening with the quarantine and the, the stress in our minds. That's also creating that. And the food that's available is the cheap processed food, which is the last thing we want to have uh, during the quarantine. Do you want to touch a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, my feeling is the quarantine is the stupidest approach that we could possibly do to public health in general. The last thing you want to do to human beings is isolate them. It is the worst thing for our mental health. It is the worst thing for our endocrine system because as soon as you stop moving your your insulin levels go up your sleep cycles shut down you know it, it's just a horrific thing to be to increase the amount of couch time that americans are already overdosing on 
not to mention the amount of screen time that Americans are getting right now is just through the freaking roof. And so everything from you know the Instagram account to creating their memes to sitting there binging on Netflix, I don't think we've ever seen more screen time consumed by humanity than in the last four weeks. And so we are absolutely screwing over our public health by this concept of quarantine. We can discuss later, hopefully not at all, but if we need to, we can discuss, you know, what about the virus and all that stuff. But in some ways, literally what we're talking about right now is way more important than public health uh, and to your own personal health or family health than anything about COVID. COVID is not important as a health threat. What COVID is important for is an indication to the world of what have we done wrong to create every three years another pandemic of a coronavirus or otherwise. Uh, this is the third, you know, massively life-threatening coronavirus that we've created just in the last few decades. SARS, MERS, and, and out of different parts of the world, you know, so SARS, of course, out of a uh, portion of China there, and MERS out of the Middle East, and now a different portion of China coming in with this coronavirus. So why are we, what are we doing to suddenly accelerate pandemics over the last, you know, three decades? And we obviously the food system. And so the food system has destroyed the ecology of the planet faster than any other technology we've ever developed. Chemical food and conventional agriculture, as it's called now, is the most destructive you know, chemical force on the planet. And you know, I lectured last year at Sun Valley Wellness Festival showing them where in China the next pandemic would come from. I didn't think it was going to happen in eight months, but sure enough, eight months later, we have a pandemic coming out of Hubei Province, dead center of the agricultural zone. Uh, of China, where the highest spring of, of Roundup and antibiotics is being, you know, applied to the to the food industry there. And so, in 2019, all of Hubei province got international attention before it got attention for the coronavirus for being one of the most toxic regions within China uh, due to agricultural and manufacturing uh, toxins that have built up in their water supply, soil systems, blah blah blah. And so, there was this huge, you know, concern over the, the public health of Hubei. Then suddenly coronavirus appears and wipes out a bunch of people. It's not at all surprising. It's exactly what has to happen because viruses are not actually germs. Bacteria, you know, kind of follow the germ philosophy, but viruses are just genetic information. When you see a virus, it's just a new genetic you know, or a new virus. It's just new genetic information responding to the stress of the environment. And so that's you know, a fascinating look at what we're creating with this food system. So as you guys are doing your keto diets and your fasting, you're in direct opposition to the biggest problem on earth right now. So it's very exciting. Your fast is literally your protest. It's you putting your, your lifestyle and your literal pocketbook in a different position. And so now instead of spending money on those three days or five days that you're fasting, that money is going somewhere else. And that intrigues me that there's actually an economic, you know, ripple effect of a ketogenic, you know, intermittent fasting or long-term fasting diet that would be interesting to measure. And I, I think you guys are, are funneling that money towards lifestyle, you know, resources. The money that you would spend on food in those five days is now being channeled towards, you know, your gym memberships, being channeled towards, you know, new community around outdoor activities, clubs, you know, all the way down to supplements and the rest. And so I'm intrigued with that. If, by the simple protest of I'm not even going to eat today, that is a vote against the common paradigm that's creating pandemics, that's creating the destruction of the ecology leading to global warming and the rest. So uh, what you guys are doing has some very interesting applications beyond what you know, the obvious biohacking stuff that you guys may be doing. Yeah, absolutely. And I, the, one of the main complaints, I, sh I don't know if complaints is the right word, but comments that I get is when, when I recommend organic food, food that hasn't been sprayed with pesticides and herbicides, I get the comment, how can I afford that? How can I spend the extra money on that? And to me, how could you not do that? But here's what I say. I say, hey, when you practice intermittent fasting, you're going to save money and that money could be applied to a better quality of food because what we eat, we become. It, it get, our cells are made of the food we put in our body. And you shared something. And let's see if you remember what I'm about to share with you. I was watching one of your talks from a few years ago and it gave me goosebumps. You actually are the only person that I've seen in video lecture that has made me cry, by the way. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> that's a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> but in this lecture, you were talking about a patient you had who kept having panic attacks after lunch. Do you know what I'm talking about here? Yeah. What was happening with her? 
Yeah, so um, this phenomenon actually, it did start with a single patient experience, but now I see it all the time. Now that, now that I've opened my eyes to this possibility of, and reality of the biology behind it, you see it all the time. You can actually see it even in the behavior of our politicians on the camera. Yeah. You there, Zach? You broke up. Well, in the, in the bandwidth coming out of Hawaii here. Um, there's too much Netflix binging going on. <laughs> totally. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, so, you know, I, with the biology that I'm about to tell all of you, I want you to start looking at your life around us and the behavior of human beings in general in relationship to what they just ate. And I, and I think you're going to realize some really profound things about human behavior and the immediate effects of a meal. And uh, so what was happening to this woman is she was consistently having massive you know, overwhelming panic attack uh, about, you know, 1.30 in the afternoon on three or four days a week. It was very common. And if you read a medical textbook, even I remember the first time I read this back in medical school, it kind of freaked me out because the number one symptom that they report in a panic attack is the sensation of impending doom. And when you read that in a medical textbook, you're just like, whoa, like, what is that feeling? Like, I mean, for me, it's like walking into Target. I have this overwhelming sense of impending doom, and I start to sweat a little bit, and I don't want to go into that space. But it's deeper than that. There's like this sense of like, I am going to die, and I don't know why. And so panic attack, leading with the sensation of impending doom, was what this woman was describing, classic anxiety disorder, panic attack. She had some generalized anxiety in the background, but not such that she was on meds or anything like that. It was more than acute panic attacks were, were the driving complaint. And so, yeah, I was intrigued by the time of day and my endocrine brain, I'm like, oh, I'm like, okay, so at that point, cortisol is dropping, you've got you know, your insulin glycemic index changing, your liver starting to do some interesting metabolism. So, so I was stuck in this hormone side of the equation. And then it came to me through that, I was like, well, what do you eat for lunch? And she said, oh, well, you know, I, I'm pretty predictable. She's like, you know, I eat this rice pilaf dish a lot. And then a few days a week, I eat uh, a chicken salad. And I have my, my favorite place. And, you know, they, they do a really good chicken salad. I'm like, well, that's interesting. As I have you noticed, if, is it on the days of your chicken salad that you're, that you're having this experience? And she's like, I don't know. I don't think so. And then calls back a couple weeks later. She's like, it's the chicken salad. And, and, uh, and so that got me starting to think about, you know, again, for quite a while I went down the hormone, but then I was teaching in a totally different, you know, mindset. I was teaching microRNA and the new science of, of genomic stress and how we express this through something called microRNA. And I was teaching on the microbiome and that, you know, 30% of the microRNA in our bloodstream at any given moment, which are these signaling messengers out of our, our DNA that translates into these little microRNA, and they go, our bloodstream, they go into our sweat, they go into our saliva, and they express out into the environment around us. And the microRNA affects the decisions of the genes within your body as to what they're going to produce. You only have 20,000 genes, but you have 280,000 proteins uh, that, that build a human body. So somehow those 20,000 genes have to decide which of those 280,000 proteins and what body they're going to build today. And fascinatingly, this microRNA is, is seems to be one of those major influencers. And so uh, some new science has come out saying that 30% of the micro microRNA in your bloodstream is coming from the bacteria and fungi in your gut and skin and in your environment. But another five, maybe 10% of your microRNA is actually coming from the food you just ate. And that's when all the bells went off in my head for this woman. I was like, holy shit. Yeah, I'm sorry for cussing all of you. It was so intense to realize that this chicken was carrying genetic information about its last few minutes or hours of life into that chicken salad. And so that chicken now contains microRNA that are signaling the stress response of being a chicken. Now I want you to think about what it looks like to be a chicken right now in the modern protein industry. It means you were born six weeks ago. Uh, you have been in a cage smaller than your body, so you can't turn around. Your beak has been clipped off so that you can't peck yourself to death. You are fed uh, only a single grain that's been genetically modified and drenched in, in a chemical that opens up all of your membranes. You have leaky gut, leaky brain, leaky kidney tubules. You're physiologically inflamed from this first second of life, and uh, you're being shit on literally from the, the chickens above you. 
you're in a factory where you've never seen daylight, you've never scratched on real earth, you've never seen what grass looks like or tastes like or, or smells like, and this is your, your life for six weeks, and then you're butchered and, and has a boiler chicken. In that short six-week lifespan, a third of your, your compatriots have died of invasive salmonella and E. coli from the toxicity of the stool uh, because your food is laced with antibiotics and pressuring uh, towards these invasive drug-resistant microbes. So that's being a chicken today. So which microRNA are being turned on at the moment that that chicken goes to, to slaughter is literally a sense of impending doom. Nobody cares about me. I'm in complete terror. I don't even know why I'm here. I have no purpose. And if you now read through the, the symptoms of a panic attack, you just coded in the genetic code in the microRNA signaling of that piece of chicken that that woman, as soon as she consumes it, hour and a half, you know, not 60 to 90 minutes later, you've gone halfway through the small intestine, you've absorbed that microRNA information into the woman. Her genome is now responsible. So to that, and now she starts triggering the genetic decisions to prepare her for impending doom and death. And it has absolutely nothing to do with her life and her, and her husband and her kids and all of this stuff. And her, her panic attack, much like many other panic attacks, always came out her most relaxed point of the day. Kids are off at school doing well. She's gotten through all of her duty list in the morning. It's kind of like her, her self time, you know, in the afternoon before the kids have to get home from school. So she's often doing her own self care. She just went to the gym. It should be like her most pleasant part of the day. And she's having a panic attack because she's suddenly getting coded uh, by that chicken. So that, that journey, now I look at somebody on, on the news and I like watching our president because I, I'm always trying to guess when was his last meal and what did he and, and the amount of inflammation that he has in his verbiage, the amount of redness that he has in his face, all of these things are going to be directly related to the microRNA signaling that he is getting from his environment. What people has he surrounded themselves by in the last few hours? All of these things are going to influence that. And at moments, you know, the reason the president is nice is because he has absolutely no filter. So it's like watching human biology with no frontal lobe filter whatsoever. He simply just says it all, all the time. Whatever he's thinking, whatever he's feeling, he just wants everybody to feel it with him. And so he's a very awesome biologic experiment. And, and you can like watch this guy go through, you know, from minute to minute, a, a journey of his own kind of emotional experience. And you can see some insecurities and all this, but you can really get the flavor of the emotion he's feeling in that moment. And sometimes you frankly get like this kind of jovial, kind of kidding, you know, kind of innocent, feel from him for a moment and they're like oh wow that's, that's a different you know, Donald Trump right there and then moments later you get this like you know tyrannical anger and everything else and it's like what is that coming from and, and you know what is that flavor and so I now I want you to apply that to yourself I want you to think about when are you the most short with your loved ones when are you the most out of energy emotionally when are you starting is it possible that your food and its journey to your plate is influencing your macro behavior? And the answer in the science level is definitely, it, it does. The question is, is that stress that the food system is expressing to you within your clinical range of coping mechanisms? Do you have enough anti-inflammatory effect? Do you have enough lifestyle and relaxation practices in your life to be able to, to absorb that level of stress coming in from the genetic information of your food system? And of course, it's not just limited, limited, limited to protein industry. Certainly horrific to be, I think the worst is chicken, but second definitely is swine. Uh, being a pig is a, a horribly tragic thing today. And then third would probably be the beef industry. Beef industry is markedly you know, friendlier than the other two, uh, to, but still horrific in a lot of, especially the US feedlot system. Um, but uh, you know, the factory you know, situation is one thing on that side, but on the other side of the equation, you have the, the, the vegetable. And I like to think about corn, like, Corn is such a beautiful plant. Like, I don't know if you've ever been in the Midwest, but if you've ever walked through a, a towering field of corn, corn, it is really spectacularly beautiful. It's a really beautiful plant, except it's very monotonous. And so when you're in the middle of a 10,000 acre farm in the Midwest, you get this overwhelming sense of programming. Like you feel like you're part of a military state or something because there is zero biodiversity on the ground. 
literally there's not a weed growing for as far as you can see under the canopy of those corn because the whole field is sprayed with Roundup consistently to keep all the weeds dead. And all you're allowing is the genetically modified Roundup ready crop to grow up through that dead soil. And so when you're down in that cornfield, you have a sense of like, oh my God, this is literally, you know, the, the factory chicken farm version on corn. I think corn, I know corn biologically thrives when it has an intact fungal community at its root system that's attached to its three sisters. You know, the, the Native American population was famous for growing an incredible agricultural system before the, the Western Europeans show up. We think that, oh, they were just you know, hundreds of gathers. No, they had incredibly, you know, complicated and, and very well established agricultural system that allowed, you know, tribes to live stationary and more than hundred gathers. They, they were stationary tribes that uh, really had robust agricultural system. They had figured out that the biodiversity within the crop created more robust returns. And so they grew the three sisters, which was corn, peas, and squash, you know, next to each other to the benefit of each of those species. And so corn would obviously do better with biodiversity around it. Even we know now that the weeds on a farm are very critical to the uh, carbon cycle, nutrient cycle of soil and everything else. And if you keep killing the weeds, you destroy the, the ecosystem uh, biodiversity and the bionutrient uh, base that they would create. So whether it's a quote unquote weed or an invasive or whatever you want to title these plants, biodiversity is always the secret to success. And so uh, I think your corn is just as stressed out genetically and is sending just as many stress signals to the environment in that GMO crop environment as your, your chicken probably is in, in that, that chicken hut. So we have a stressed out food system in a third of the world. 70% of the world, fortunately, is still fed by a peasant farmer. Monsanto and Bayer now and all these companies are doing as much work as they can now to take over the developing world agriculture. And that's tragic. We're losing you know, hundreds of thousands of farms around the world now uh, annually. In the U.S., we lose 8,000 farms a year, uh, family farms to, to factory farming. So we're losing, you know, the entire foundation of food sovereignty and food, food system stability uh, to this very unstable, you know, factory farm environment where we can see, like, last year, 18 million pounds of beef got recalled in the United States alone for toxic E. coli and, and deaths from the E. coli in the meat. When you have an industry that, that has to withdraw 18 million of pounds just to be able to isolate, you know, a couple of cows, but the system is so integrated and so massive where they're killing 5,000 cattle a day in a single building, it, it doesn't take long before you hit 18 million pounds contamination or uh, containment necessity. So we have a very vulnerable, very fragile food system now built around, you know, the scaling of, of conventional agriculture. And all of this is leading to the epidemic we see with, with cancer, with autism. I mean, could you speak a little bit more about that? And then uh, talk about Farmer's Footprint and your initiative to restore the farmland and the great work that you're doing with Farmer's Footprint. Yeah. So, the, you know, it's so fascinating to be alive. I want all of you listening to this to know that you are here on purpose. And there's no way that you're not here on purpose because you showed up at an extreme tipping point moment in human history. Homo sapiens sapiens in the fossil record at least has been around 200,000 years. In that 200,000 years, we've been a consumptive and destructive species since our beginning. If you haven't read the book Sapiens, uh, it's almost a must read. It's a fascinating look at the kind of anthropologic, you know, historical sequence of Homo sapiens on the planet and how we have systematically hunted to extinction anything larger than us. As of almost you know, 10,000 years ago, we'd already achieved that. So we are very good extinct, at, at extincting species around us for our own preservation. Over the last 40 years, what we shifted up, our, that kind of warlike mentality against biology around us was to the microsystem. We started killing the micro infrastructure of soil and uh, ecological you know, systems in the 1970s. And we did that through turning our wartime development of Agent Orange uh, developed, you know, during Korea and Vietnam to uh, an agricultural technology. So we shifted organophosphate technology for killing jungles and warfare to killing weeds in your backyard in 1974. Uh, Vietnam War ending 1973, desperately needed a new new way to get organophosphate development into a marketplace because they couldn't sell their, their millions of pounds of of Asian Orange every year. So Monsanto previously with Asian Orange now switches over to a new patent on a New York phosphate that would be called glyphosate. 
which would become the active ingredient roundup. And then since that 1976 debut, actually, you know, with that, that first widespread uh, distribution of the agriculture industry in 1976, it, that was the very first year that we saw swine flu jump into humans. And so and it's a very interesting phenomenon where we created an, an, an artificial you know, or you know, toxic ecologic injury at the microbiome level. And immediate response was a new virus that would kill millions of people. And so now you accelerate. So that was 1976. We saw uh, avian flu hit humans for the first time. Uh, just a few years later, years later, the late 70s, and then uh, there would be a pause, and then you know maybe due to just lack of surveillance, but then uh, 1996 hits, and we started to see uh, pandemics of H1N1 type uh, flu strains, uh, and then we would see uh, the SARS in 2001, 2002, and so and then accelerating since then. So what you can see is with each kind of exportation of chemical farming to different environments we have further toxified the environment. And uh, interestingly, the swine flu of 1976 came straight out of the US and European agricultural system, but it didn't come out of China. We didn't develop a Chinese-based pandemic until 2001 with SARS. And that's very interesting to me because it, that's you know the, exactly the era starting in the late 1990s, moving into the early 2000s, that the U.S. started to export, you know, GMO farming throughout the world. 1996 was its debut in U.S. and and, and Europe, and then uh, we exported that to Asia over, over the next decade, as well as Europe and the rest. And so, you know, we saw SARS in 2001, 2002, and then MERS we see in 2010 or 12. And MERS was uh, coming out of the Middle East, and so Middle East was the last kind of category, last territory of of um, infiltration of, of these uh, chemical farming practices and agriculture injuries. So that's kind of you know pertinent to corona, but we can see tracking in the same time period chronic disease emergence. So you mentioned autism. In 1975, the year before, we really see broad application of, of Roundup. We had one in 5,000 children with autism. Today, we have one in 30 or one in 36, depending on who you read. And so we've gone from one in 5,000 to one in 36. There's a lot of debate whether, well, maybe we just missed autism back in the 1970s. You know, maybe we just recognize it more. So it's not really an epidemic. It's just we, well, that could be true because doctors are pretty, I'm very willing to, to believe that we missed something massive. What I'm not willing to believe is that mothers of 1976 somehow missed that their children had autism. A mother knows very well if their child has a learning disability or you know, dyslexia, let alone something as severe as autism. So we didn't miss this in 1976 because I trust the mothers were just just as you know, uh, you know, conscientious and, and aware of their child's condition then as they are now. And it's always the mothers that bring autism to the attention of physicians. We have no screening for autism. You know, it was some new screening process, process that we put into elementary schools, and then we find all this autism. Fair. We don't have anything like that. It, it's always the parents that bring to the attention or the teachers that bring the attention of the physicians, that there's a problem here, can you diagnose this? And, and so we have a true epidemic of autism, we have a true epidemic of attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, which now affects you know, one in 10 children formally, but we think it's more like one in six children in the United States. Um, we have one in, one in four children faced with obesity by the time they're an adult. We have one in three you know, in pre-diabetes, diabetes state, like, you know, the numbers are just obscene all the way down to major depression, which is now one in two adults. And we see more and more children suffering from depression. There's actually whole pediatric seminars that, you know, physicians and pediatricians travel to all over the world, from all over the world to go to these seminars now on how to start antidepressants for children under the age of two. That is freaking ridiculous. Like that should not exist and certainly didn't exist when I went through when I was born in the 1990s. We had never heard of major depression in a two-year-old. Uh, and let alone a one-year-old. And so now they're, we literally have pediatricians starting kids, you know, as soon as they're starting to walk on antidepressants. And so it's a very, very terrifying, you know, emergence of, of disease epidemic in our children. Uh, le leukemia and lymphoma is through the roof. Brain cancers, primary brain tumors in children has gone exponential since the 1990s. And so we see all of these chronic diseases from kind of the neurologic to the autoimmune to the cancer all happening in children under the age of 17. 
recent Medicare and Medicaid uh, surveys uh, are suggesting that 52% of kids in the United States have a chronic disorder by the time they're uh, 17. And so that's startling. And a lot of those dysfunctions are allergies to their environment. Our children can't even tolerate food. Our children can't tolerate real breathing air that has pollen in it. You know, if we can't tolerate eating food and breathing real air, we have a serious problem with human biology. And so over these last few decades, we've, we've lost the capacity for biologic wellness on Earth. And so this whole concept of, you know, Elon Musk taking us to Mars, I think it might take something that drastic. If we don't change directions of the human species, we're not going to tolerate biodiversity because you know, we, we, we have lost the ability for relationship. And we're going to die much younger and have much more horrible diseases as we become more and more monocular or, or mono uh, genomic in our in our daily experiences. And so we're our children are now manifesting this this intolerance to the planet that Homo sapiens you know, developed in over two billion year period. And so we have done something catastrophic over these last four years. And so. With our soil science, we developed you know, a dietary supplement line called Ion Biome. There's an Ion Gut Health, there's Ion Sinus, and there's a, a whole product line coming out now for skin and other systems, there you go. And so Ion uh, became kind of our, our educational way of bringing this cutting edge soil science and how the microbes help human cells kick into a regenerative repair state. We've channeled all of our, our profits from that into uh, our nonprofit as well as some other you know, root cause solution uh, subsidiaries within our companies to figure out how to solve the problems that are, that are you know, racing towards us with our own extinction. And so the nonprofit we started is called Farmers Footprint. I appreciate you bringing that up, uh, Ben. It's uh, been a really incredible journey. We started just thinking we were going to shoot a documentary on the Mississippi River, which takes on about 85% of the roundup that we spray in this country consolidates it in one river. Now, the last 90 miles of that river runs between Baton Rouge and New Orleans, one of the poorest areas of our, our country, but uh, is now the sickest part of our country. It is the highest rates of cancer in the entire developed world. The, the medical world refers to this as Cancer Alley, that 90 miles of the Mississippi. And so you know, the World Health Organization you know, finally comes out and says, glyphosate might be a carcinogen. It's like, no, we proved it in this country. We can show you the water concentrations. We can show you what happens to a population of complex genetics, and they all get cancer at the end of this river. And so you know, don't tell me this is a theoretical or a possibility. This has already happened. We did this. And the, interestingly, before 1996, the Deep South had no leadership in the cancer death. All the cancer death was in the Northeast and a little bit of prostate cancer in the Northwest, but it was never in the Deep South. Now it's Louisiana, Tennessee, Mississippi, all of those deep south, right in the watershed of the entire Mississippi River. That's our epicenter of cancer. Between 1996 and 2007, we did that. In just 11 years, we did that. And so it's an extraordinary story of destruction of human biology on the tail end of destruction of ecology. And so we, all of our funds going back into this now nonprofit, teaching farmers to, to, to become a part of a new economy. Uh, transitioning from chemical warfare against the world and against the, the microbiome of their soils to a regenerative, cooperative, co-creative process with their soil system. And the exciting thing is Mother Nature shows her grace to us here in that these farmers can see vitality returning to their soil in a single season. If they just stop spraying and stop plowing their fields for one year, they see soil vitality, earthworms, microbial return, you know, resistance against weeds, resistance against pests coming in in a single year. Here they were spending, you know, bank loans worth of money on inputs of herbicides and pesticides and losing the battle. They simply stopped fighting and Mother Nature delivered all of her biodiversity and solutions in a single year. And now they don't have any invasive weeds because biodiversification of their cover crops took over. Uh, that problem, and they no longer have pressure from single species of insects or weeds because they've created a biodiversity ecology which is always balanced and doesn't require human intervention and micromanagement. Of. So it's been a really exciting journey to find out that the farmers are ready to make this transition is very exciting. I think medicine is going to be way behind. The doctors are not going to lead this revolution. I've given up on trying to convince my colleagues to become you know the the, the solution. And certainly, there's a lot of positions that are being part of the solution. But I think, you know, as an industry where Western medicine is not going to be the leader here, but fortunately, I think big ag 
is collapsing and the agriculture industry can revolutionize and take us back to those pre-1974 levels of disease. So we're about to run out of time here. I, I just wanted to just tie this all together so the audience understands that cancer, autism, this epidemic of disease, viruses are all linked to mother nature. It's linked to the earth. It's linked to how we're farming and how bad we're doing our farming. We're creating these monocultures that are creating, well, monocrops creating monocultures in the gut, leading to disease, essentially making us allergic to the food that we're feeding ourselves, correct? Is that, is that a fair thing to say? So by teaching these farmers how to farm the right way and build these crops the way that they're meant to be to, to grow, we could eat this food, we could repair the body, we could give the body what it wants, and we could essentially reverse the trends, correct? That's right. So Yeah, just, just like that field recovering in a single season, your gut is an organic garden. And when you start to foster carbon cycling and microbial diversity in your gut, you're going to see, see the same resilience. That, that pesky can, candida or the small bowel overgrowth So yeah, that, that gut is an organic garden. And so the same rules and recovery rate that we see in a farm happens in your gut. And so if you will start to focus on micronutrient, micronutrient diversity, fiber diversity in your diet, um, you know, all of this is going to start fostering that repair of the gut microbial diversification and the invasive weeds, candida, small bowel overgrowth, all these things that are now kind of part and parcel start to go away. What we're showing is that if we take this, you know, my, microbial intelligence, the communication network between the bacteria and fungi, and we amplify that, that product ion that you were showing earlier, we have a sister product that's being produced for soil systems on large scale agriculture that are being tested with very large hemp growing and vineyards around the country right now to show that if we amplify microbial messaging, we can, you know, by 10x, accelerate the recovery of the soil system and the yield that you see from those plants. The tomato plant study that we did in the fall was pretty amazing. We did 3.2 pounds of tomatoes out of uh, conventional agricultural uh, tomato vines with nitrogen, potassium fertilizers, blah, blah, blah. We then said no fertilizer, let's just do the communication network between bacteria and the mineral nutrients that they derive. And we got 35 pounds of tomatoes out of single vines. And so you went almost a 10x leap in, in productivity. That's what happens in the gut. What, hap what does 10x yield look like for you? It's 10x energy levels for you. It's 10x nutrient delivery. It's 10x hydration. It's, 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 it's 10x your, your, your true personality, essentially. Absolutely, and your productivity. And so you'll see your sense of purpose, your sense of self-identity. Your sense of this does emerge over the, the year and a half, you know, following this start, just like it does on the farm. And so in my clinic, it took us years. We started working on this, you know, thing, you know, seven years ago, years of seeing this in clinic where a year into the process, this woman comes in, you know, crying and hugs me. I'm so happy, Dr. This is the happiest moment of my life. I, what happened? Well, last week I left my husband who's been abusing me for 30 years. And it, Having watched that a few times, it took me quite a while to realize, oh my God, this stuff rebuilds the micro boundaries. It helps rebuild the gut lining and the vascular lining and the blood brain barrier. Those healthy boundaries at the molecular level, then of course are going to lead to healthy macro boundaries in your life. You're going to start to draw those emotional boundaries and the spiritual boundaries, and your sense of self identity will become strong. If you're listening to this to being like, I feel like I'm chasing my health, I'm biohacking on and I don't know why I'm here. I don't know what my purpose is. How do I participate in anything? It's likely got to do with this journey into finding self. And finding self is going to be found through my microbiome and biodiversity that will then support this macro experience of who you are and what you're here to do. You're here at the tipping point of history. Our own extinction is seen 70 years out. We can change everything. You must have shown up to be part of that. And I'm just so you know, passionate and excited that you're here as part of that solution, um, as part of that solution-based purpose within humanity as a whole. Amen, Dr. Bush. We are out of time and I want to give the audience a chance to contribute to this. I have been personally contributing to Farmer's Footprint and using um, Ion, which used to be called Restore, now Ion, both drinking it and using the nasal before bed. My dog also takes it. And it's no coincidence, by the way, that 
I feel right now that I am living on purpose with my purpose. And I wake up every day excited about what I can do to create and educate the world. And I've been taking this for over a year and a half. So I don't think that's a coincidence. Where can they go to learn more about Farmer's Footprint? Farmersfootprint.us is the website there. You can see the first of the, the documentary series that we're, we're building. Uh, it's a 20-minute film about an extraordinary family in the Midwest that's uh, making this transformational change for the food system at the micro level uh, with a message that can really scale to the world. So farmersfootprint.us will find it out and ways to support us in our mission. We have very exciting initiatives starting to take a hold around the world. Um, uh, we'll be releasing a much bigger version of the nonprofit in the next few months as we start to tackle not just soil, but soil, water, and air systems around the world. Uh, for a healthier planet, a healthier future. So we would love your support and passion from you as well as the company and anybody else you think would want to be philanthropically involved in the future of communities. Thank you. We'll put all those links in the notes of this podcast and YouTube video. And I also have a special coupon for you all to get eye on. The, those of you in my Keto Camp Academy, I just launched a new membership add-on for this dashboard. It's a $5 add-on and 100% of the proceeds for your membership goes to Farmer's Footprint. So those of you in the Academy, if you contribute, if you add that to your membership, 100% of that goes to Farmer's Footprint. Dr. Zach Bush, thank you for your brilliance. Thank you for always showing up. I love the work that you're doing. I support it. And I'm grateful for this opportunity to chat with you. And I can't wait to do it again. Thank you so much for the support, the synergy, the passion, your sense of purpose. And you've created a powerful place. Thank you. Thanks for including me in it. Thank you, Dr. Bush.